What's up everybody, this is Professor Keegan and I am here with our video lecture for this week's Tuesday class. It is March 31st, so we're about to get to April. Um, uh, time has really gotten wacky uh, being in our houses all day long. Um, so uh, happy April as of tomorrow. Um, I'm going to start this lecture out just going through some quick reminders as I usually do and then we'll get into today's content. Um, so really quickly, I wanted to remind you, I know some of you have been um, falling a little bit behind on uh, work that needs to be submitted due to scheduling conflicts, other classes, adjustments to your workflow. Um, so <clears throat> what I'm going to ask is that if you need to submit um, posts, discussion entries that you've missed, that you do so by um, the 16th of April at the absolute latest. That is the last scheduled day of our course meetings uh, on the schedule there. Um, and that will give me time to turn that work around and get it into the grade book. So that's going to be um, the hard deadline for any work um, in the class other than the final exam. <clears throat> so please do get that to me as soon as you can. Um, the 16th is going to be the last day that I can um, unfortunately take um, past due assignments. Um, if you are falling behind, I'm noticing this as we get further into this remote situation. Some people do seem to be drifting off the course schedule a little bit. Um, if this is you and you're struggling with a particular situation um, that's preventing you from doing your work on time or following along um, with the discussion uh, on Blackboard, just let me know what's going on. It's always better to kind of reach out and touch base rather than just kind of ghosting. Um, this way I can push resources to you, I can um, support you in getting the work completed, we can talk about strategies, I can look at drafts, right, all that stuff that I can do for you. I can't do unless you reach out. So please do that if you find that you are starting to miss assignments and you're starting to get um, notifications from me that things are incomplete, okay? Um, However, if you do have late work and you want to send it um, to me, please don't just dump it into Blackboard because Blackboard will not notify me and I will not remember to go back and grade it. Um, instead, email me directly. Um, just let me know that you have something you want to submit um, and I will take it via email and I'll go back into Blackboard and retroactively overwrite um, your scores in there. So please email first and then um, I'll correct things on my end. Um, now, um, one, one final kind of step we have coming up in the semester is a final essay exam. Um, I'm going to be posting the prompts for that essay exam by the end of next week. That will give you at least two weeks to work on this assignment. Um, I will let you know when I do that. And I'm going to have this be due by the end of our uh, scheduled final exam time, which is Thursday the 23rd by 3.50. So I'll set up uh, a Blackboard assignment window for that um, assignment, and it will just be due at that particular time. So you might want to start scheduling now um, if you know you have a conflict with that day, that day and time. Um, maybe have a plan about what you're going to do to get that work to me. Um, you can also reach out to me about this. Okay, so that's kind of like we're tapering down toward the end of the semester. We need to be thinking about um, culminating experience and getting things turned in. Um, again, communicate with me, always better than not, um, and let me know how you're doing. Okay, so um, we are in the middle of our unit, Unit 5 on the AIDS crisis, and um, we've done some work looking at um, United in Anger and the history of ACT UP and their um, activist actions during this period. We've looked at Strikers, the Difficult Decades, and kind of parallel histories going on in the trans community. And here we are now beginning a book that we're, is going to kind of stretch throughout the rest of the semester um, by Sarah Shulman called The Gentrification of the Mind, Witness to a Lost Imagination. And Shulman is going to be walking us through some of the economic, political, and cultural effects on uh, the U.S. of the AIDS crisis, kind of the, the un, um, sort of unconscious effects, because we haven't as a nation really come to grips with the fact that the AIDS crisis even took place. Uh, a lot of you noted that in the discussion entries for today. Um, so uh, we're going to be thinking about consciousness, history, memory, uh, cross-generational contact, loss um, in this section. And um, today we're just getting started with this book. So I wanted to start with this image of Times Square in New York City, which as you can see, 
is a very has become a very very hyper hyper saturated capitalist space right this is a space where every square inch of the city is kind of owned by corporations even the sidewalk is um a space that's controlled by business uh and so i, I we want to start thinking about what has happened to the landscape of america in the period since the AIDS crisis began, and how is that maybe connected to some of the factors uh, that um, contributed to the crisis to begin with? How are these things intertwined? This is something that Shulman's going to be walking us through from her perspective. Um, so really quickly, I want to go over this concept of gentrification. I had you kind of write a bit about it on Blackboard, but I wanted to give you kind of a, a simplified definition of this term before we start to complicate it by talking about what it means to have your mind gentrified. Um, so in urban planning, uh, gentrification is a term for how city environments change, sorry it says change underneath the, my uh, movie box here, when they are flooded with new wealthy residents. So it's about um, the shifting populations in city landscapes and what kinds of um, economic and political shifts happen when the city starts being for a different population than it has been traditionally. Um, and so we need to think back to the history we covered during the end of World War II when we talked about all those GIs coming home from the war and the GI Bill and the way in which that money was used to help uh, build the American suburbs and the American white middle class. Um, so during those post-war decades, post-World War II, from about 1950 to the early 1980s, what happened was a lot of white and wealthy people using those benefits from the GI Bill that people of color and um, LGBT, LGBTQ people were not given. Um, those people took those benefits and they fled these newly integrating, um, racially integrating cities. Remember, um, Jim Crow was ending. Um, cities were starting to integrate their school districts. A lot of white people did not like that. Um, and so they picked up and moved to these all white enclaves in the suburbs. This you know, infamously took place in Detroit. Detroit looks like it does today because a lot of white people in the, in the 1960s decided to leave the, the city core uh, uh, and take their white kids out of that integrating school district. They did not want their white children going to school with black children. Um, and so Detroit is a really interesting case study in this effect. Um, so what happens is that as all those white people leave, People of color and working class people, uh, also working class queer people, are left behind in the cities, um, which are, are then becoming poorer because of all the tax base that's leaving. So the school districts are getting worse, right? Um, public services are becoming less funded. And you can see there's a real contrast between kind of urban decay and these like super wealthy, almost gated suburban communities where there's a lot of white wealth. So up until the up until the late '80s, that was kind of the situation. Um, but then along comes the economic uh, stock market boom of the 1990s, and with this, white wealthy people started to um, want to invest in cities and uh, clean them up, make them habitable for uh, this new kind of n like nouveau riche white wealth that was being built in the 1990s, and so. Um, this idea of urban revitalization starts to become a policy initiative that many cities are pushing to bring white money back into the cities, clean up the cities, turn, uh, like refurbish old buildings, turn them into expensive housing, right, and thereby um, make a huge profit. Um, and the, the justification was, well, we need the tax base for the cities, but... Um, what really happened was social services were never never really came back from their defunding in the 1970s. Instead, what we ended up with ended up with was a really privatized type of city where uh, people just were like rich people and poor people hardly ever even interact. Um, so that happened in the 1990s. A lot of the effects of this were um, rents skyrocketing, right? Because what was low rent housing was kind of flipped to become um, high priced housing that these new people, white people could move into. Um, along with these white people comes an interest in um, more heavily policing neighborhoods. So um, um, more funding for police, more police on the street, 
um, an increase in, car in arrest and incarceration. We have things like stop and frisk in New York City where street level crime is the most important thing that police are paying attention to. And um, they're stopping just, they're racially profiling and stopping anyone who looks suspicious um, in a given neighborhood. Um, we have the privatization or corporate ownership of uh, public spaces and services. So things that used to be kind of funded by the city are now taken over by uh, private corporations and run for profit. Um, public spaces start to disappear, like parks, um, even just uh, being able to congregate in, in places. It's, it's no longer legal to even congregate on the sidewalk. Um, we also have, along with this, the homogenization and destruction of lo local culture. So a lot of ethnic cultures start to be displaced from the city and replaced with a kind of white middle class, kind of Starbucks type um, culture, consumer culture. Um, and along with that, a pushing of poor people out of the city where they've traditionally lived into less safe and more remote areas. So now people become really dependent on um, underfunded mass transit to get to their jobs in the city and then they have to get out back out to these outlying areas that become the kind of new we could call them ghettos right it's no longer inner city ghetto it's like suburban ghetto so there's a huge flip in like people with money coming in and then pushing everybody else back out to the to the suburban environments where there's very little resources very little shopping right um, where those white people used to live so it's an inside out flip now, um, I wanted to show you some of the effects of this because they're quite obvious if you look at the record of photography of any major city in the United States. So um, one space that's been super gentrified is Times Square, which I, I began um, my slide deck with today. And what's interesting about Times Square is that uh, traditionally, well, at least in the, in the 1970s, um, Times Square was seedy, uh, you know, low rent, low class place where, because it was kind of off the beaten track, they had, there was a real important sexual culture for gay men in Times Square. You can see here that um, the, Times Square had a lot of porn theaters. There was a lot of kind of burlesque dancing, stripping. Um, you can go see X-rated films there. And there was a really kind of cruisy, cross-class, uh, interracial kind of gay culture, street culture there, people hustling, people hooking up, um, that a lot of gay men really um, valued. And actually uh, Samuel Delaney wrote a really, really great book about the change in Times Square called Times Square Red, Times Square Blue, because by the, by the 90s, um, Times Square starts to look more like this. And that gay culture that had flourished in these low rent movie theaters, uh, cheap hotels, um, gay, like uh, kind of like seedy gay bars like the Stonewall Inn had been, um, that gay culture was completely removed and replaced with things like Broadway plays, Bank of America, Disney now owns a huge amount of uh, Times Square property. So you could see how corporate. Uh, corporate money comes in and starts to privatize and shut down and replace all this queer culture with something very middle class, something very middle America, something very corporate uh, and very kid friendly. Um, so as Times Square stops being for the people who live in New York City, it starts to be for tourists with their with their dollars, right? And so this is just one small example of the pro of the sort of larger process that Shulman is is reflecting on in this book. Um, Another shift, we can even see this locally um, in Grand Rapids. Grand Rapids is going through a massive kind of gentrification process right now. It's very evident if you drive down the street and see things like, uh, like this, right, um, where you have kind of an older, more working class looking house right next to the new kinds of um, urban loft living uh, apartments that are getting built all over the city that are not affordable housing. Um, they're expensive. Uh, so people who had been living in the older homes, those homes get knocked down, and then where do they go, right? They can't afford the new apartments that all these young people are coming into the city and renting. Um, this is another really interesting thing. Um, Division Street, South Division especially, has long been a kind of traditionally uh, working class of color area where a lot of social services are clustered for people who are homeless. Uh, there are soup kitchens, there's, there's a night ministry, there's um, sort of like methadone clinics and things like that. 
And right now, there's an entire kind of battle going on um, between those constituencies and uh, the sort of in, uh, real estate and economic development interests in the city who want to take back South Division. Um, the interesting thing is here is like, take back from whom? Poor people who've been there the whole time? It's really weird framing. It's really gentrified framing. Um, and they want to res restore, right, a once vibrant business corridor uh, that really is the one central place you can go in the city if you're uh, poor and need help and get all your things uh, in one little area. What, this is my cat, by the way, this is Daphne. Hi. Say hi, Daphne. She just loves to crawl all over me. Um, so, like, uh, if those social services are dispersed by the buying up of this property, what's going to happen is that then people have to go all over the place to get stuff, and it makes them even more vulnerable to being able to get services. Um, a lot of those social services are also on division because it's on the silver line, which is the free bus line that goes through the core of Grand Rapids where you don't have to pay to ride the bus. If you get off the silver line and um, get onto some of the other lines that go out into the neighborhoods, then it becomes, you have to pay, right? So notice how the business interests want the real estate, but the effect will be profits for them and cost for uh, poor people who are already struggling. GVSU is actually involved in this. So this is a, um, a, a set of plans, city plans, for the development of the CHS and medical complex at, at GVSU in the Belknap neighborhood. And these blue um, boxes are actually houses, working class people's houses that GVSU purchased and, and knocked down to build that um, you know, university infrastructure that is now servicing people who are coming in to get degrees who will then be um, set up to have careers, right, and not necessarily stay in the city or live even in that neighborhood. So you could see how the loss of housing is being replaced with more expensive housing. Where do poor people go? They probably have to leave the city. They probably have to go live in a in like a more tangential area. Um, and so this is how cities become less diverse, less class diverse, especially, um, and how. Um, Urban planning can be used to displace vulnerable populations. So that's really the process that Shulman's describing here um, economically. She's also describing a sort of mental or even spiritual process of gentrification, which we'll talk about later in class. So how are gentrification and AIDS related? Um, in The Gentrification of the Mind, this book, Sarah Shulman argues that AIDS, sorry, this is AIDS right underneath the box there, AIDS was a, was a major factor in the acceleration of gentrification in major cities like New York City and San Francisco. She says, you know, that this disease coming in and striking particularly poor and vulnerable populations created an opportunity window for business to come in and take stuff away from those people. So she argues in this book that AIDS actually removed a population of poorer people, particularly poor queer artists and activists, from areas of the city that, that could then be seized and revitalized, right? And I put that in quotes because like revitalized for whom, right? Um, is the question here. And so revitalized for profit. So she says that as queer people died from this disease uh, with little, little spending or help, to um, keep them alive, right? The low rent apartments they were living in could be taken over by developers, uh, refurbished and then sold at much higher prices to these new wealthy residents who were coming in wanting to live in the city. And so um, she says that, you know, this was, this is a way in which epidemiology and urban planning work together, right? Where like populations that are struck by illness often then become targeted by urban policy that wants to get that undesirable population out of the city to begin with, right? Um, and this actually affects the diversity of cities. So she says that um, working class people who lived in New York City as part of a diverse community were then replaced by, you know, because they a lot of them died with white wealthy people who had different investments. They were motivated by consumerism and, and wanting to like, 
invest in their own families, but not necessarily in a community. They wanted access to the things the city offered, but only, but only if they could live among people just like them. And I actually have a really quick clip of Shulman being interviewed about this, where she kind of walks us through that history that I just covered. So I'll quickly play this. You know, there was a lot of mythology about what what caused gentrification in New York City, and two groups that were really blamed were artists and white gay men. They were both ex fundamentally blamed for gentrification. But now that we're more adult and we understand how things actually work, gentrification was policy. Mm -hmm. There was a deliberate decision to stop building low-income housing and to start giving tax breaks to luxury developers like Donald Trump, who built all of his uh, luxury buildings with corporate welfare mm -hmm. based on our tax money. I said it was law and lending. That's right. So when you like to say, you know, we are growing up and we know better, but people don't know better. This is not a well-known story still, I don't think. Well, I think that the, the origins of contemporary gentrification start with, um, after World War II, the GI Bill. And this was a way for the federal government to give, give a lot of money to developers who were creating the suburbs through the bodies of the vets. So the vets got very low income, very low interest loans to buy housing in the suburbs, but the suburbs were racist and it was only for white people. Mm -hmm. So this is the period that we call white flight after World War II, where a lot of ethnic whites take advantage of these loans and move out of the city. And this is a time of low rents, open city, a lot of political movements are starting to develop. And then in the 70s, and I think it's a, really a reaction to the radicalism of urban life in the 60s and 70s, we start to see redevelopment. The initial myth was that the city was broke and that by bringing in richer people, we would expand our tax base. But as we all know now, New York is overflowing with rich people and all of our public services are in disarray. So that was clearly a lie. And then, and then we see the development of luxury housing, and it's aimed at the children of white flight, mm -hmm. the children of these people who move to the suburbs, who come to New York having been suburbanized, which is a new phen cultural phenomena, and they want to trade freedom for security. They come from the gated community mentality, and they want things that are familiar. They've lost that taste for difference mm. that has always come to represent the city, city That's life. That's very much the story that you write up in The Gentrification of the Mind, that book. Right. Remind me and, and the audience how this came into your life, how you started hearing these different attitudes. I think it was your students, right? No, I, um, you know, it's funny because I've been publishing novels since 1984, which is quite a long time. And if I look back at my early novels, I can see that gentrification is happening in the background of everyone's life, but I don't really know what it is. Mm -hmm. Suddenly there's all these regular white people, suddenly there's cash machines, mm -hmm. suddenly, and only at about uh, five or 10 years into it did I realize, oh, this is, this is what's happening, mm -hmm. this is planned development. But it lurks in the background earlier, so I, I, I understood it from the beginning, but in an instinctive way. But in terms of people's attitudes, I mean, that's what you're getting at in what you had just said, is people are bringing different attitudes along with those things changing on the street. Well, you know, um, there's also this very strong correlation between gentrification and the AIDS crisis, and that's something that I address in my book, Gentrification of the Mind. Because don't forget that the AIDS crisis began in 1981, which is right at the beginning of the high point of, mm -hmm. of the kickstarting of gentrification. And so you have key neighborhoods where you have very high death rates. And those neighborhoods now are among some of the most gentrified neighborhoods in the city. East Village, West Village, Lower East Side, Harlem, Chelsea. In fact, the two most gentrified cities in America are New York and San Francisco. So you have a lot of people dying and apartments going to market rate with great rapidity in key neighborhoods just at the time of gentrification. And that's certainly a factor in turning things over. It seems like this whole story is related to our policing crisis too. How do you see that? Well, I mean, now we're seeing our mayor trying to gentrify Brownsville, East New York. You know, he, he doesn't want, I mean, uh, developers do not want there to be any kind of autonomous people of color neighborhoods right. left in New York. And through the guise of what they call affordable housing, which is not affordable, they're going to systematically gentrify those neighborhoods. Okay, I'm going to stop this here. Um, so you can see how Shulman discusses this as a process that gets that kicks off in the early 80s and and sort of snowballs throughout the 80s and into the early 90s with AIDS as a 
an important co-constituting factor in the removal of bodies of people from urban space and the replacement of those people with other people. Um, so uh, she, you know, Laura Flanders, who was the other person in that interview, then says, well, isn't this about the attitudes people are bringing also? It's not just about new people, but, it, but the way in which these people are thinking about the city. And this goes to Shulman's point about the gentrification of the mind, right? That um, Shulman makes the larger point that gentrification has had cultural and ethical effects on us. Uh, it's not just about who lives in a space. It's also about the process by which we have excused those those replacements and deaths or, or ignored or forgotten that they took place. Um, and so she describes the gentrification of the mind as a process by which um, these things happen. One, complex realities are replaced by simplified truths. Two, diversity of thought is replaced with homogene homogeneity or sameness. Three, productive discomfort is replaced with comforting ignorance. Uh, and this is going to be a theme throughout the book. We're going to uh, finish with the conclusion, which is called de-gentrification, the, the pleasure of being uncomfortable, right? Um, Four, values of artistic inquiry and creativity are replaced with consumerism and profit motives. You know, um, if you want to be an artist or make art today, it's very hard to do that in a non-corporate or profit-based modality um, because of the gentrification of like almost all the processes by which things get made. Um, and we're gonna talk about that next week. Uh, five, freedom of expression is replaced by security and safety. So more police, more cameras. We put hostile architecture everywhere. I don't know if you've ever noticed this, but if you've been walking down the street and you see kind of like a ledge and there's spikes sticking out of it so that no one can sit there, right? Or the benches that have really rigid arms right in the middles of them so no one can sleep on them, right? There's a way in which we are pushing people out of space, particularly poor and homeless people. Um, so that we can feel safe because everyone's just like us, right? So this, this need for sameness and the conflation or confusion uh, of sameness with safety is something Shulman says comes from this process. And lastly, and this is something we'll talk more about when we talk about the gentrification of gay politics, um, her chapter uh, in the middle of this book, she says that the legacies of queer liberation and AIDS activism are are erased and replaced or forgotten and replaced by a gentrified homonormative gay culture and politics that values marriage above everything else. And she says this is an outcome of the same processes of gentrification that where some people disappeared and other people then in, kind of came in and took over uh, the gay movement. Um, so, you know, that's gentrification as a process, AIDS as a factor in that process, and then the outcomes on us as people who, if we are old, if we're younger than maybe 35, probably grew up with no clue that the AIDS crisis had really had the severity and intensity that it did. That's what a lot of you are saying, right? So we could think also about your own lack of knowledge as an outcome of this process, um, that our thinking about this has been gentrified, our understanding of history has been gentrified. Um, so that's just a few key ideas to get started with this book. I am going to have you navigate over to discussions um, to respond to a general post about this video. And then for next class, we're actually watching a film, um, which is loaded into Blackboard for you. So um, I'm going to ask you to think about how the film might be connected to this process of gentrification, because it's a film about how uh, LGBTQ people have preserved their own personal histories through the use of home movies and home archives. Um, so be thinking about the archive as a space where some of this history has been preserved from being lost. Um, so I will leave it there and I'll talk to you over on Blackboard. All right, hope you're well.